Um, now then, it's the case which has made headlines around the world. In a small city in Idaho, the local community has been rocked by the tragic and brutal murder of four university students. On the 13th of November, in the small town of Moscow in Idaho, four university students, Zana Kanodal, Madison Mogan, Kaylee Gonsalves and Ethan Chapin, were stabbed to death in their beds in the early hours of the morning. The events from the night were shrouded in mystery, with two other housemates present at the time of the attack left unharmed. Court documents allege that one of them heard crying just after 4 a.m. and even saw a masked man in black clothing inside the house. Almost seven weeks after the murders, on the 30th of December, a suspect was arrested, 28-year-old criminology student Brian Koberger. He was apparently unknown to the victims. However, police say phone data shows he visited the area near the scene of the crime 12 times before the attack, often under the cover of darkness. Koberger has been charged with four counts of first-degree murder and felony burglary. But many questions still remain in a case which has gripped and horrified the world. Well, we're joined now by ex-FBI agent Jennifer coffin from Florida, as well as criminology expert David Volson to hear their thoughts on the case. Um, Jennifer, I'm going to start with you first of all. I mean, we, we heard the reports over here of these crimes being committed. I mean, utterly shocking. Um, but just explain a little bit about, because this is the city of Moscow in Idaho. This is a very quiet place. I mean, this has really torn this place to the core, hasn't it? Absolutely. This is a small town that hasn't seen a murder for over seven years. And then to have something so horrific happen, it's just really gripped this community that's known for hiking trails and quaint eateries and ice skate rinks. So this was something very foreign to this community. So uh, we've seen a little bit of, uh, of what went on that, that terrible night. Um, what what else has been discovered since then? What have, what have the police and the FBI been working on? Well, they've been working tirelessly on this case, as you saw in the preamble, seven weeks to solve this crime and bring somebody at least into custody for what occurred. What they worked on was not only phone ping triangulation, meaning there's three towers there, and they were able to actually show that the individual accused was in various locations, very close to this house, in and around the time of the murder. They were also able to show that an Elantra, which was connected to this individual, was in this area through video footage. And most importantly, there was a knife sheath left behind. And on that knife sheath was DNA they were able to connect to the alleged perpetrator. And you, you believe, um, sort of from the evidence, the fact that that was left on site, you feel like there was something together that he would, um, that this sort of fantasy he had in his head of what he was doing, that in some way it must have been disrupted for him to have left evidence like that at the scene. Yes, exactly. In these types of murders, oftentimes the killers fantasize about them months, even sometimes years ahead of committing them. So they have in their mind how everything is going to go. But in this case, many things started going awry. There was a dog that was barking. There was a, another roommate that was making noise, opening doors, closing doors. Uh, just the act itself of stabbing might have been perceived to be one way, but then actually when they committed it was quite more gruesome than they had anticipated. All of this came to a head and he ended up leaving the scene, leaving two others alive in that house. And um, mm. his arrest was interesting. I mean, it really does appear to have been the most remarkable twist of fate. Yes, no, exactly. He made a cross-country trip uh, to see uh, the parents, uh, and that was unique. I think most people believed he would, this individual would be arrested in and around uh, Idaho or Washington, which was very close by, but instead it ended up being thousands of miles away in Pennsylvania. Um, he's appeared in court already, but he won't be expected to go on trial for a long time yet. You believe that they're putting together a very vigorous defence here for him. What makes you think that? 
Definitely so. We've seen that already with the motions. Uh, there was already an exclamation of his innocence, uh, that he believes he will be, quote, exonerated. So I believe there will be a very rigorous defense in this case, and uh, as well it should be. Everybody, everyone is afforded that. Thank you, Janet. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, David, looking at this, I think one of the most surprising things, and we, we have to say here, allegedly, all the way through, yeah, you know, yeah, he's yeah, been exactly. innocent until proven guilty. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but he is a criminology student, and you know of cases where criminology students have, in, in fact, perpetrated crimes. Yeah, I can, off the top of my head, I know of six in this country alone. Mm. So, look, criminology, is it the cause or an effect? And it is simply not pathological to want to study the criminal mind. That's what I do. Mm. It would be pathological to want to study the criminal mind to understand something about yourself. And that, indeed, is what is being argued in the probable cause affidavit that, uh, in relation to Brian Koberger. I've taught criminology students for about 25 years, and I would say a handful of them have creeped me out. No. Uh, yeah. And the, do you and... find your... Because it's quite hard to say. If you're teaching something, you have to do that subject in its entirety. But there must be moments you go, essentially, I might be teaching them something that they may use not for the greater good. And usually you can tell the ones that are going to creep you out pretty quickly because they're not interested in criminological theory about, or about the processes of conducting appropriate forms of research. What they're interested, uh, interested in is telling you about serial killers and going into the minutiae of what that, a particular serial killer might have done or not done. And they're wanting to impress you with their knowledge. And with that type of student, I do something I do more generally these days, which is self-censor. I won't go into some of the detail with them that they are seeking from engaging with the course, and I tend to do that more generally in terms of the kinds mm. of information I give out mm. in the media about serial murder. So, casting your professional criminologist eye over this case, and bearing in mind, as we've said, that you're innocent until proven guilty, what are your thoughts here? I was interested in several of the statements that Jennifer made. I, I see this as a... So this is not serial murder. This is mass murder. It's different to spree murder, different to serial murder. And so there are... Way, and I would also say there are hybrid elements to what's been already been reported upon, what's already in the public domain, what the American prosecutors and the FBI and others are saying. So for me, what's going on is that this was somebody... Uh, who was looking for power and control, was trying to impress, was feeling um, the, a way of dealing with some of the underlying psychological needs that he had that were not being met in the community could be met through engaging in these extraordinary behaviours. Um, I would slightly t uh, suggest to, that Jennifer felt that there may be... Um, you know, he makes a mistake because often one says the first time one commits a murder that we, they don't know what's going to happen. They don't know how the victim's going to react. They don't know how they're going to feel. They don't know how they should behave in the immediate aftermath of the murder having taken place. But this was a very high functioning. The person that's been arrested and accused of this murder was very... was highly intelligent, was high functioning, and therefore there's a sense in which we also know that he studied serial killers, in particular when he was at DeSalle's University in Pennsylvania. He studied under somebody that I knew quite well called Catholic, uh, Catherine Ramsland, who had, had studied the, a serial killer called the BTK. So why, why leave two? I mean, thank, thank goodness they, they are here to give their report on it, but why do that? Well, I, I kind of felt... Now, this you might say this is spurious, but because I, I know the person that's been... Uh, accused of this murder, had studied under Kathleen Ramsland, who studied the BTK, um, a, a serial killer, by the way, who had a background in criminal justice. So there's another serial killer that has a background in criminal justice. He kills uh, 10 people in the 1970s, 80s and 90s. And guess the first target of that man's killing cycle was uh, a group of four people, a family of four, uh, in a house that he had uh, never previously had connections to. Mm. So there's a sense in which you've got some eerie echoes going on here. Yeah. Um, uh, whoever the killer happens to be, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the, 
knife, the, the leather knife sheath that was left on the bed um, with the DNA on it. And there, there it is there, illustrated. That seems to be a remarkably clumsy move. Or a remarkably clever move. Because one of the things that's really struck me about the person that's been arrested and accused of this is he, he is intelligent and high functioning. Now, even having put to one side that we know that many uh, killers, the first time they kill, can they've never experienced that before. They can be book smart, but not necessarily criminologically smart. Um, he, uh, we've heard Koberger make public statements that Jennifer alluded to, saying he's looking forward to being exonerated. So would a highly skilled, intelligent um, student who was teaching criminology, a PhD student, have made such a basic error? Yeah, but how error? can leaving your DNA be... In like, in I don't understand. That doesn't make sense to me. Well, it's so the first thing that the, the defence will say, it's, um, well, how did the DNA... Get you and I, I could have your DNA. We, we, we gave each other a cuddle be before the interview started. Yeah. Your DNA's on me. I could go wherever I wanted to go in the next right. hour and your DNA would be where I would go too. So mm. the defence, the yeah. defence is clearly going to present issues that will suggest um, that Koberger is innocent and even uh, the triangulation of the phone data that Jennifer drew yeah. attention to, which mm. is absolutely right. Well, you know, he's a, 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 I, a, the Moscow isn't so far away from Washington uh, State University. So it would be natural that there would be some of those towers might ping. Yeah. There will be a defence, which did is a, why a, we <laughs> have to say he's innocent until proven of course, guilty. Of course, did allegedly visit the area 12 times. Um, so there's, uh, this is definitely something that has yeah. uh, gripped America. Um, it has been fascinating. There is a, uh, a, a... And it's awful when you know that there are you know, four victims here that, no, that people horrible. are, are now fascinated by true crime. Um, but uh, I think the most important thing is that whoever murdered these young people uh, is hopefully swiftly brought to justice. Absolutely. Um, Jennifer, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Always good to see you as well. Thanks, David.